And uh, during that time, I joined as a singer for the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, and they announced wanting to start an educational program, which was right up my alley, um, trying to bring advocacy and activism to make schools more inclusive. And so I left the classroom to take this full-time position, and it's been a wild and wonderful ride. And I'm excited to tell you more about the program and its, uh, its successes throughout the course of this panel. That's me. Hello, everyone. My name's uh, Caitlin Maga. I use she, her as my pronouns. I'm here in Oakland on the traditional land of the Ohlone people. I'm one of the co-founders of Alphabet Rockers who make music that makes change. And I thought why you can read the bio, but what I would say is I'm a creator. I'm shedding the imposter syndrome. And I'm here to invite everyone to tell their story whether it be through music or percussion or through meditation. Um, I think your voice matters and every one of your students' voice matters. And that's kind of what we're here to do is to amplify them. The end. All right, hey everybody. My name is Aaron Kerbel, he, him, and I am a drummer and a percussionist, a teaching artist, professional musician. I started the organization Rhythmology a few years ago. It's uh, an organization which uses rhythm to build community connection and joy in the world, all things that we need much, much more of. I'm also um, a, a, a teaching artist with many different organizations in the Bay Area, including Young Audiences and Destiny Arts. And I'm a drummer for such bands as Rupa and the April Fishes and Jazz Mafia. Honored to be here today. Hi, everybody. Good to uh, see everybody on this panel and good to meet you. My name is Armando Castellano. 20 years ago, about almost two decades ago, I started an organization called Quinteto Latino to address the, my lifelong um, journey to uh, uh, be able to express myself and my identity and the values that I care about as a Western-based fine arts artist, as a classical musician. And that's led into an organization that seeks to represent Latino issues in classical music from kindergarten until a, becoming a professional musician and addressing um, uh, inequities in, within our system of learning and arts learning. And so today I'm a professional classical musician and teaching artist. I'm the, the artistic director of Latino Music Education Network, my advocacy organization. I'm also the solo hornist of the band, Quinteto Latino, which is a part of the org. Thanks. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Antoine Davis. Um, I'm a professional body percussionist and, and stepper. And I've been, uh, I have a, a dance company I co-founded in Las Vegas called La Molati. I was in Stomp for a couple of years and, and uh, worked with Step Africa. I work with a few nonprofits in, in the Bay where I teach stepping and body percussion to kids of all ages and adults. Um, my focus is to ignite people's creativity to get us to bond through music as a community and uh, a different way of using the body to express yourself. All right. Well, thanks to all of you for being here for this uh, panel discussion. We have some questions um, we'd like to ask you. I'm very, I feel great being here. I'm Till Trebuzzi. Uh, from, as Michelle mentioned, I'm from San Mateo High School, but I'm also the visual performing arts coordinator for the high school district here. I started teaching 35 years ago. I've been at San Mateo for 29, uh, and I'm excited to be here and help moderate this panel discussion. The first question we have um, is uh, for all of you to please share a story about your youth and how the music spark found you. Um, so if I will, I'm just going to call one of you at random to start the thing going. And since Aaron, you're nodding your head, I'm going to have you go first. I knew it was going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I was kind of a tough kid, um, for my parents to raise. Um, 
I was I was diagnosed with lots of lots of things. ADD, OCD, ODD. Basically, if you had a D in it, I likely had it. And, um, you know, one thing that I would do when I wasn't being a terror was I would I would get obsessed with certain things and put all my attention and energy into those things. So f for a while, it was organizing markers on a table, got into dinosaurs, got into baseball. And then around middle school, I found drumming. Now, I, have a, I have, do have a musical family. Uh, my cousin, Doug Bickle, played with Tito Puente and Arturo Sandoval. Um, my grandfather, Bill Bickle, was an uh, organist at the Pittsburgh Pirates baseball stadium in the, the 50s. And uh, my uncle played the drums. And um, my father used to take me to the, the drum circles at Venice Beach in Los Angeles. I don't know if anyone's ever been to those. But when I was a kid, that was kind of like the first moment when music really overtook me and I was transported. That's the first time I really remember you know, standing in there with 60-plus uh, people drumming and expressing themselves, and I, I had no idea what it was, but it just kind of washed over me and um, really got me ignited and excited about the power of, of rhythm and drumming. Um, so I got my first, after I kind of destroyed all the pots and the pans in the house, um, I got my first drum set uh, when I was in about middle school, and then I took to, you know, practicing all all day all the time in my garage um, and I found that uh, drumming really helped me to channel all that all that neuroses and rage and whatever that was that I had as a kid um, it gave me a, an outlet for that something that was positive it gave me uh, I mean over the years it helped me to build my confidence it gave me a purpose you know it turned me from like a super shy awkward kid into someone that really had a a strong, clear voice, and and I would say that um, I remember my my once I started playing the drums in the beginning, I had this dream that all I wanted to do was um, play music and and get to get to travel around the world, and and I eventually got to do that when I moved up to the Bay from Los Angeles around 2002. Um, I I joined a band called Rupa and the April Fishers. I actually helped form the band. Um, and it was led by a, a practicing physician and social activist, General Badass, in the Bay Area named Rupa Maria. And uh, we've been a band for about 15 years, which sounds like an extremely long time. Uh, I feel very old saying that. But in the course of that time, we've, we've released six albums uh, toward over 30 countries and uh, gotten to really use it at music as a platform to address uh, a variety of social issues. Um, and, and I just feel like, for me, music... Music is my medicine uh, that I that I use to heal myself and also share it with the world, and uh, it's also my gateway to a higher power and my preferred language to speak. Thank you. Um, Who would like to go next? Ah, uh, do it, Antoine. Uh, okay. Hey, um, music. <laughs> um, my. It's always been a part of me, music, playing music. Um, my family are big music people. Uh, my uncles played in bands. My grandma, before she passed, let me know that tap was her passion. Before she got married and had kids, tap was what she did. Um, so for me, um, I didn't start seriously performing until college in 2000. I was gonna play football and do the NFL or something like that but I didn't have the grades. And so my friend drug me to a step practice. Um, and I was like, oh, this is so much better than having 300 pound linemen try to crush my kneecaps. This, this, <laughs> um, it was, it just, it was, it ignited my soul. It, it became my obsession. Um, and I just, it was just, it was like love. It was like, this feels right. Playing music with my body and, and playing music with other people. And, and, and manifesting that way. And so um, the music spark touched and flirted with me in my, in my childhood, but we started going together when, when I started, when I got in college. And then um, I got my first gig in, 20, in 2003 with Step Africa and toured with Step Africa and stepped. Um, and it was great 
And then now I have the, the performance bug and I want to be an artist for the rest of my life and do this thing forever. Um, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Caitlin. Wonderful. The music spark is a great way to put it because I took the recorder class and I took piano lessons and there was something in that experience which may speak to a traditional um, American school music education experience, but that's not music to me. Music to me was when I heard a, a student um, that I was doing an anti-racism program with read Nikki Giovanni. And when she read the poem, Ego Trippin', I felt every sensation in my body come alive. The rhythm, the storytelling, the musicality. And then I was hooked. I was like, that's music to me is finding that authenticity that comes through in, um, in performance. And um, I'm not chasing that experience, but that is something I'm very much present to. And that shifts over time, but it certainly, um, keeps me interested. And that's only a one minute response, but that is really where the music spark began. That's great, thank you. Um, Armando, where'd the music spark find you? For sure, thanks. And thanks to everybody who's responsive and inspired by what everyone is saying. There's a couple of stories I can think of from my childhood that I think where the music spark happened and they were intersections where I kind of switched over. One was that I started playing the trumpet in the fourth grade and, and my, my parents, I grew up in the 70s in fourth grade, it was in the late 70s, and my parents had purposely moved to a very white neighborhood because they knew those schools were going to be better resourced, and indeed they were. I had music lessons in the school, and as the only Latino family there and the only Latino family at the school, I experienced an incredible amount of otherism and just general racism, and, and I was really socially very difficult for me, as well as my learning. But the music, I when I took music, I actually could thrive and be, and I felt like I could do something successful, and 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 I think that that made me really stick to it, and and it it um, it was something that I thought I could do, I I could do, and I did well, and I related to that. I also had a very special middle school teacher, who saw my. Um, uh, music ability and he let me play all the instruments in the band. I would take one home, practice for a few months, then come back and play it in band and go all the way through the band. I was so, I'm still so grateful for him. I'm still in touch with him, God, 40 years later. And the last spark I would say was definitely when I knew I could be a French horn player is when I saw the first person playing in an orchestra in my, I was 17 years old. I was a junior in high school who wasn't a white man playing in a professional orchestra. It took until I was 17. And that, that was the day I knew the switch in my head went on. I didn't even know I was looking until that happened. And, and I know how important it is now for kids to see people that look like them, whose names sound like them, and who speak similar languages as them on the stage, teaching them and being with them, performing their artwork up on stage. I just, and that's the basis of what I do today. Thanks. Thank you. And then Mitch. I'm happy to go last on this one because you've all inspired me to change my response. <laughs> um, well, so, but what I was initially going to say is um, music and the intersectionality with my sexuality have always been very interwoven. Um, and so when I was young, I was raised in a small town, Williamstown, Massachusetts, Western Mass, um, in a very Catholic family. My dad is recently ordained as a deacon. Um, and so being gay was kind of not uh, like an option. Um, and I was in the sports route forever and ever and ever. And the first time um, I really had a moment to shine, I took piano lessons. But um, when I was in sixth grade, I was in Guys and Dolls, the musical. I played Nicely, Nicely Johnson. And I sang, sit down, you're rocking the boat, if you know that show. And um, at the end, there's the sit down and everyone raises their arms. And it's just like, I got a standing ovation every single show and feeling that energy and where I was like, I just feel like me finally, I feel at home. And yes, there was a version of me that was part of athletics, but I was finally me. Um, and I had this relationship where I wasn't ready to say my sexuality for the longest time. And I would start leaving music and it would always pull me back because that's just where I felt the most like myself. Um, and joining the, the gay men's chorus, San Francisco gay men's chorus, that was the first time where I felt like I was making music to positively affects change and sing as form of activism and to change people's hearts and minds. And 
um, open to new perspectives. And so, I mean, it continues to inspire me and that spark, that's what we seek is to how can we reignite that spark every single day? Um, so very proud. Great, thank you very much, Mitch. Okay, we're on to our second question. Um, this is uh, about um, social emotional learning. Where do you see the intersection of music and social emotional learning? And as a follow up to that, how can we bring more music into the classroom? So um, is any, who would like to take a crack at this one first? I'll, I'm happy to try. All right. Okay. Um, I, I really, I think social, I asked my wife this question. I'm a honey, honey, what do you think about like this question? If you, if, if you think about me and my teaching and my work, she's a, she's a career educator too. And she told me it's everything that I do. It exudes and everything, I, the way I walk into a classroom, the way I talk to a student or empower their voice and, and make a place for them to be vulnerable. I'm really concerned about the mental um, and social, emotional well being of kids in my classrooms, and especially of uh, the, uh, the way we express feelings and where it's a safe place to express our feelings to each other. And ultimately, having those feelings and those emotions come out in the projects that they create that I play on that instrument over there. That's, that's my ideal situation. I want them to be talking about what's important to them and how they're doing and for me to express and give that voice and create a safe space for them to be able to do that together collectively to each other and ultimately to the projects. Um, and, and, and specifically, you know, like doing a project where I came into a fifth grade that had lost two fifth grades, both fifth grades had lost their teachers, they had quit suddenly. And I was supposed to do a residency with them. And we just talked about how they felt about that transition. Very tough year for them. And the whole project was about that. And whole residency, performance, everything was about how they were feeling about that loss and grieving that loss, as an example. And, and in regards to your question, music into the school day, I know when I'm working with teachers, I'm um, really trying to I feel like, especially in classical music, especially for with a classical musician, there's a lot of judgment about what it should be or could be or what's right or wrong and to do it the right way or the wrong way. And just trying to strip down what the layers are behind that, move those out of the way and have it be more about creativity and expression and less about right and wrongness. And one of my favorite things about being, uh, when I'm a teaching artist is that we don't, and as a musician, as an artist, you don't have to have a right and wrong answer. You know, it's a very freeing experience. Kids actually get that right away. It's the adults that put all our baggage on top of that and take, and, and take that creativity away. So I think just the adult teachers leading with vulnerability and being open to different kinds of answers and not there's a right and wrong way to do it. We'll get the kids to do that too and just free people to be able to do more music where it's just singing and dancing or whether we're you know, learning actual projects. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Armando, that was great. Um, Caitlin, would you like to uh, go next? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I get sort of like triggered by the SEL language. I think because there's like, I feel like we're getting graded on being human. Um, so I really appreciate what you said, Armando, because what we, what you just modeled is the vulnerability of like how to show up. And so when we think about integrating ourselves into a classroom, also if that includes modeling boundaries, um, for, for us as musicians, we all have different languages, even as artists, but like for me, music is everything. So if I hear something that I want to sing, I'm going to sing it, even if I sound silly. Um, and giving permission for that space um, is an access point. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting. I just want to say this as a parent. Like I remember when I brought my child home from the hospital, and I knew I was supposed to talk to them, and I was so uncomfortable, and I felt like this is so feels so contrived. Um, and I also was, you know, there's all those judging voices, but these don't they're not related to that birthing experience. They're related to just like human experience of just like, how can, am I judging myself really as a parent or as a teacher, as a white person, as a woman, uh, cisgendered, now I'm dealing with this, like whatever your layers are. So in that moment, 
I was like, well, how about if I just sing something? Like I'm putting you on this and gonna change your diaper. And I'd feel so ridiculous, but in my body, that feels like permission to live. Like if I'm just singing, I have nothing attached. I don't even care if you think that sounded good. <laughs> But it allowed it to just be like, I'm here, I'm doing this, I'm narrating it so that I can actually show up for my baby who I needed to talk to. I think that has nothing to do with your question and hopefully something to do with a heart space. Um, so when I have had the joy of being in classroom spaces, which I really miss, it's like knowing when a song moves somebody, how do you notice that? How do you notice when a rhythm of stepping affects a child in your class and how do you create more space for that? Um, how do you play a song that really moves you? Michelle chose a song that moves her at the beginning that might have questions for you. Like, what's it about that story in there and creating space for that. So I want to share a song this week that I love. This could be at any age. And I want you to bring a song from your home that makes you feel X. It can tie to the curriculum. Uh, this is the most playful space for me as a, as an artist is how to tie things into values and heart space, um, and music. Thanks, Kaylin. Um, Mitch, how do you view that intersection of music and SEL? So, I mean, it's funny because when, if you were to ask probably any single person in this world, do you like music? The unanimous answer is going to be yes. It may be different styles of music, but the answer will almost always be yes. There is, people love music. And one of the things about music is that it touches your soul in a way that words often can't. Like when words fail, there's always music to help express how you're feeling. And so I think one of the beautiful things with music is the way that it can elevate and reach parts of our body that words alone cannot. Um, one curriculum, actually this is a plug for work that the chorus recently did in partnership with the It Gets Better project. We did a curriculum that's six weeks long called Outside Voices where students look at the importance of storytelling and why your story is important because so many students think, oh, my story is nothing special. And so helping them realize like everyone has a story that needs to be told. And then looking at ways that artists have taken stories and turned them into an art form, whether it be through spoken word, through slam poetry, through um, rapping, through any other type of musical art form, dance, um, and telling their story through art. And so creating a space for them to even dig deeper into their stories. Um, so that's one way you can bring it into the classroom. But I just, with the program that I've done and with a lot of these artists, it's all about bringing stories and helping students dig deeper into where they stand by allowing different avenues to access that through their art form. Um, and each student will respond in a different art form as well. Um, so one may be playing an instrument, one may be through body percussion. And so giving those avenues and accesses and, and not forcing students on a specific way, like you need to play piano to express how you're going to feel, but like introducing, it's our responsibility as educators to introduce them to all the opportunities and possibilities so they can find which one they most connect with. Um, so. That's great, thank you, Mitch. Speaking of body percussion, Antoine, Hey, yeah, you know what? All that was super, super dope. I loved it. And all it was said. Um, yes. The structuring of class is how you intersect those things. I love it. So for me, I've been training with Destiny and I've been a teacher teaching stepping for a while. Um, so coming into class, having an opening circle, allowing everyone to have a space to talk and then setting up that space to be like, this is at, we're at, we're, we work as a community here and stepping. You are um, in stepping the history of it really quick is um, you are it the dance form started in 1900s. You have young black men, young black women who are going to school who are not embraced by the community. So they started their own organizations to make sure they made it through. And so I make sure the kids know that we're a community here and we're all safe here in this space. And so the starting of that at the top of class throughout the semester, we're building trust, we're building community and we're letting the music bond. And then with the opening and closing circle, we're allowing, we want, encourage you to speak your mind and, and um, through different icebreakers and different games. And then there's a point for me that I, I really want you and I'm really encouraging you to use your creativity, how you see and hear music to create your music in this class. So I'll teach you some music and then after a while, we're gonna, you're gonna do your own music. Um, 
And I think that is kind of how it should be, like how it has been and, and what works for me best. Um, and yeah, allowing people to tell their stories is how you bring it into the classroom using different vehicles to tell that story from music to song to puppets because in Indonesia they use puppets. It's really crazy, it's really dope. Um, life is incredible if you allow it to be and, 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 and showing the kids different ways of expression and different ways of telling your story is kind of, I feel it's my job to do. Um, there's not just one way of doing it. There's not just one way of showing your love and sharing your passion. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Antoine. I, I love what you said. We work as a community here. That's a that's a great thing to to start a rehearsal with, or however you work with your kids in whatever classroom. That's great. Thank you, uh, Aaron. You're next. Man, I'm like I'm seeing myself on the screen, which is one of the weird things about Zoom. And I'm like making the stank face for like these ideas, which is awesome. I'm just hearing so many cool things. I thought I would maybe focus on the second part of the question, like how, how to weave music into the school day. I thought a lot about the first part, but um, a lot of people here said some things that sparked that. Um, you know, I was just like spitballing earlier today, just thinking of random things, like even something as tiny as like the school bell, you know, like that's such a like aggressive, you know, call back to like the factory, you know, kind of system and which is what it was modeled on. And it's like, what if instead of like that ugly bell, there was like a beautiful sound? Or what if they hired local musicians to play for two minutes in between classes? Or what if they got a kid from the orchestra to just play their violin or something? You know, just something like that. Um, I was thinking of the fact that as teaching artists, you know, we're uniquely positioned. We're not really... I don't think we don't have to adhere to the same kind of uh, structure that the, the school teachers do the work for the district. So we have the freedom to, you know, what I say is like we can create a vibe. Schools have really bad vibes in general. When you walk into a school, if you've ever been into an incarceration center or a prison, uh, very similar just in the way that they look, they're designed. And it's just like as a kid, you know, I always try to imagine like, it's and I remember being in, in those schools that were like built in the 50s and it just like has bad vibes, you know, it's like we have to bring a kind of warmth and this create this vibe in our classroom using our unique art form. So like in everything that we do, we could infuse, we can make it musical, we can make it rhythmic, you know, so I try to do that. And what one thing I do, I noticed when whenever I speak like just like this in my normal voice to any group of youth. I could tell right away when they start to check out, when they start to, to lose focus. And it's almost like, you know, that Peanuts cartoon, like with the wah, wah, wah trumpet, the trombone sound when an adult talks, you don't actually hear what they're saying. So like over the years, I now have come to expect that. And so what I do is um, I will talk in a musical way. So basically I will, I will speak in rhyme for the whole class, or I will play my drum and talk to the beat for the whole class anytime I need to say something and just like Caitlin said you know she's sing, she's just singing randomly you know and that um, kids love that they respond to that um, and at some point in our lives we kind of evolve out of that but I think that you know we never really evolve out of that we always respond to musical communication rhythmic communication and so the only problem with that is if you set the bar there then you're gonna have to keep rhyming the whole time or else they'll kind of be like wait what, why are you doing that so basically it's it's on us you know we can we can there's no limit to how creative we can structure um our classes and, and really any teacher can do this any teacher can play music you, you you noticed when you all came into the webinar today that there was music playing and if you and i'm sure we've all been on the zoom calls where there's no music playing and it is dry as sandpaper it's like why not just share your sound put some music on there it creates like a whole vibe so like the, you know, music can be infused in so many different parts of the school day that can, um, you know, create that warmth and create that feeling of community space that allows people to be vulnerable to open up. That's great. Thank you, Aaron. Um, one of the things that um, I've been doing since I've been teaching distance learning um, with my classes is I open them all up with a selection that I, for could be any sort of reason, but I didn't used to do that. 
you know, I would start, we'd start to rehearse. Um, you know, I didn't play something and then have everybody focus on it. Um, and it, it's really made a difference in how I approach everything else I teach too, because I'm trying to get deeper, just really the very short thing, just to get deeper and get the kids to something else to think about musically. So, um, yeah, I want to thank you all for your real thoughtful uh, responses to that question. We have another question. Um, this one is, uh, you know, we have a, we have a, a, a world today that is uh, tough for people to adjust to in a lot of different ways. And um, this next question is about how do you view music as a vehicle for social change? And can you share a specific example? Um, anyone want to go first? All right, Caitlin. Ah, how do I view music as a vehicle for, for social change? I'm at a point where um, I'm actually challenging the whole children's music industry. Uh, we stood up as a community of black um, led artist groups and said it's not acceptable that in the children's music category this year, there was five white artists. There were zero artists of color. Um, these things aren't accidents. They aren't just like, oh, those were the best recordings this year. Every song that we create, we choose a narrative. And so when the dominant narrative of, of play and white led experiences, which are led by erasure of cultures and challenges and racism that we're all seeped in, we're left with just kind of um, a waiting. So children are waiting for the talk or the side work. And so I feel like music has to be essentially telling our life story and our responsibility to one another. Um, what I'm currently doing also, we have several albums, Alphabet Rockers. We used to write educational music for the classroom because I know music opens you. And so if the music sounds in your rhythm, your learning accelerates, your learning vibrates, uh, the vibes happen. And I also knew that we as a, as a collective of artists had an important multiracial truth to hold and we needed to bring it forward. So we wrote a few albums that did just that. One's called Rise, Shine, Woke, and it's about power and advocacy um, and racism. And then one's called The Love, and that is about gender identity. And we did that as cisgendered artists. And we invited folks from our community to share their voices as stars, as songwriters, as truth tellers, so that we could have a vehicle for social change that includes everyone, um, where gender identity is actually a shared experience. Actually, I have a pin right here that says there are only infinite genders. So music changes you. It changed me as a writer, it changed me as an artist. I can't show up and forget what I've already learned from the music I've heard. Um, and what I believe the power of music, even if it's just without words, is it becomes like, you know, I heard this person say this, it's like a worm that goes into your body. So what are the tapes for the worms going through our bodies? And sometimes it's those catchy commercials that like you remember your products, right? So what do you want as a, as a leader? in your community, even if it's just right now a very small community, if it's just your family or your loved ones and your classroom, like what is the, what are the waves you want running through your body? What are the truths you want to share? So that's how what we choose to listen to is our culture. And that is where we have the opportunity for a change. Thank you, Kayla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, social change starts with the individuals too. Um, Armando? Yeah, I like to go. It's just because I was so inspired with some of the stuff Caitlin was saying. And um, thanks, Caitlin, and everybody. What, um, in terms of the vehicle for social change, I was thinking about how, how I navigate power in the classroom and how we as a system in the class navigate power, whether it be my interacting with the teachers, my interacting with the students, or my interacting with the school systems, the principals, the cohorts of teachers, the cohorts of VAPA teachers, the superintendents. And I was thinking how um, I try to use my work in the classroom and the, the products that created by the kids and the students as, as um, a tool for building awareness around equitable arts and, and, and talking very openly about the difference in arts access between brown majority schools and white majority schools in the United States 
and at, at the micro and the macro levels, but, but, uh, but um, and talking to and teaching, build, educating educators about what culturally competent, you know, equal arts education is for Brown students too. And, um, but through, through the projects, like I don't start there, I build trust there through the students and then the students create a great product. And then I use that to leverage for change within the system. So I know as a 50 year old artist, I've been a teaching artist for about 25 years, right when they started to use that term about 25 years ago, um, that I'm like in my fifties, I, I just wanna talk who's the highest in power. I want some systems changes. Oh, let's just talk about systems change. You know, and that's what I was reminded in Caitlin's answer about building power together collectively as black led orgs and black and brown led orgs and being a collective voice for change. And so um, whether that be in the classroom with a bunch of brown kids building power to create change within their own school or their own school system or community, or whether it be us as artists, as mature teaching artists, as owners of organizations doing the same thing collectively together. So, thanks. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Um, who'd like to go next? All right, Mitch. Um, so one of the powerful things about music, especially when lyrics are involved, is that we all interpret the music through our own lens. And so when you hear a song and you resonate with lyrics, it's because of experiences that you've had. And one of the uh, craziest moments that people have sometimes and I'm sure you've all gone through it is when you hear either like the backstory of why the song was written by that artist or you see it associated with some other type of connection you're like I've never thought of the the song in that way and the storyline and how it could also have that type of meaning um, and so that's what one of the things we do with our assembly when we go into schools is um, as singers share their stories we have one where a singer talks about how he realized he was a trans man later in his life in his in his mid-20s, um, not when he was still younger in a youth. Um, and then we sing the song from Avenue Q, If You Were Gay. And just like talking about how his community embraced him was like, it's okay if you're gay, it's okay if whoever you are, we accept you for who you are. Or we have a singer who shares a story about um, having to go to conversion therapy and being coming from a Mormon family. And then we sing the song Creep by Radiohead. Um, but we don't say the F-bomb, <laughs> we say freaking special. Um, but, but regardless, like it really then like you feel that pain of like, I feel like I'm this creep and thinking of it in this way. And it's the, a song that so many people can resonate with. Um, and so I see that music, if you can give that avenue for them to view it in a different way and help guide students to like think of music in a different way as an educator, um, you automatically are opening up this new realm and this high level of thinking that they may not have had before. Um, one other thing that I do uh, in the assembly that is incredibly powerful is beforehand, we do a lot of work to learn about the community. And I have students from the Gender and Sexuality Alliance, the GSA, some call it Rainbow Club, Pride Club, whatever it may be. But I have them and honestly write down hopes that they have for their community. And so I collect those. And over the course of the final song that we sing, it's by the Judds. Um, it's called Love Can Build a Bridge. I have students from their choir read out loud these anonymous hope statements so that I'm giving voice to these students who may not feel comfortable otherwise coming forward and saying what they hope for their community. And it's an incredibly moving and powerful moment. Um, and then mixed with this message of where they're saying love can build a bridge between your heart and mine. So giving the students the voice, even if it's not necessarily sung or played, but allowing them to speak while music is playing and just ways to get creative and encourage them to use their voices and in a safe way. Um, I think that's one very positive and effective way to create social change in a school community. Thank you, Mitch. That's great. Um, Aaron, go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see, how can music be a bridge to social change? Um, well, I just wanted to uh, bring it back to our attention that we're in the middle of this pandemic, you know, year into it. Um, and I, I'm kind of really fascinated and curious by just like the effects and the toll that it is taking on our collective mental health and our well-being. 
especially those of our youth um, and just everyone, you know, that's um, just trying to trying to get by without like physical touch and the ability to gather safely. And, um, you know, I, I think just like the remembrance that I think the importance of musicians and artists in a moment like this can't really be underestimated. And, you know, I'm just, I just tried to like do a, do a, a little mental like test to, to imagine this last year without, without having music, without having the influence of musicians, <laughs> like where would people's mental health be without, you know, all the songs that we heard, the videos, the memes, all the things that were created by, by musicians and artists in general. Um, and I think that, you know, we've played such a, a huge role in just kind of like keeping everyone sane and um, also imagining the world that we do want to live in, you know, and where do we want to go? I think artists and musicians play a huge role in that. Whether or not we're listened to, that's another question. But um, I just, you know, wanted to mention something specific um, that I just did last night. Uh, I led a, uh, what I call rhythm rectangle which is basically a Zoom virtual drumming session on Zoom. You know, we're in a rectangle shape. It's not a drum circle. Um, and, you know, people from all over the world joined. There were people from Malaysia, like these elder women from Malaysia. There were folks from Mexico, all over the country. There were teenagers in their bedrooms. Everyone, um, they tuned in. They had their drums. We were, we were, you know, all playing in real time together over the Internet. There were about 50 people drumming. Um, and for me, it just like blew, blows my mind. I've, I've done it a couple times, but uh, you know, that's something you can't do in real life to, to be in one space together, but then have people from all over the world, you know, playing at the same time and connecting like that. For a lot of people, when uh, they reflected at the end, they said this was the first time, you know, in as long as they can remember or in the last year at least, that they felt a sense of joy, a sense of hope, a sense of connection. And, um, you know, I think that that's, that's very powerful. Um, and I think that could be included under, under social change, just like the, the whole issue of um, how do we move on once we kind of get through this moment and we're able to come back together again? I think that there is going to be, I hope there is going to be a renaissance of human connection. Um, and the people who are the artists and the healers and the gatherers and the community leaders, um, hopefully will <coughs> people will look to us as like the, the guides, like, okay, like heal us. What do we do? Give us some tools. Like, let's give you funding. Let's give you like a platform. Let's, you know, um, and I think that we, we will and can play a really big role in, in helping us to move forward and imagine, you know, how we want to reconnect with each other and, and live in this new world. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, someday we'll be back together, but it'll be different. How different we won't know. Antoine, um, you're up. All right. Um, listening to everyone was super dope and inspiring, and and then a roller coaster of like, oh, maybe I shouldn't. Well, okay. I use history of stepping um, to not only show kids, not just kids of not just kids of color, but just the kids in general that the ingenuity of a human when you have a group of people that are taken from a place to another place and have and have their their life essence their instruments taken away what do they do uh, and how beautiful it was for them to create so <laughs> what you have is these 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 people who have the juba dance and who play the juba dance with music the instruments are taken away we go from the juba to the patent juba to handbone and then we we now are at tap dance and they were now talking about stepping um and then allowing the kids to know that you just because <laughs> there's no separation between us and y'all we're humans and the collective consciousness of creativity is upon us is in us um and so and so for class so class is more the music is more of a trojan horse to show y'all to really engage your creativity in the greatness that is you you're great. You're a genius. The instrument you have, your body is perfectly tuned. The, the machine that runs it, your brain is perfectly normal. Um, your creativity is no better than mine. I just happen to put a couple extra thousand hours of rehearsal, but 
your creativity is just as good as mine or even better. Um, and so let's get you on in the breakout rooms. Let, let, let me give um, leader positions to certain kids and let them run this and then switch it around. So everyone gets to be a leader. Everyone gets to um, understand what it is to be, not only be in the community, but to help facilitate a community. Um, so the music is really a Trojan horse. Um, it's, it's really about inner in, it's really about proving to the young people and even adults that there's a musician in you. you, you, you've been an actor, you've been a, you've been a director, you've been an artist your whole life. Um, this class we play, that you, even though in your life, the musician that you are, we all play, you play acoustic in this class, we're playing electric. That's the difference. There's no, I'm not taking out a stomp and clap. You got this. Um, and so for the kids, um, and so for the students, not just the children, but the adults, I really want you to know that you've all, you've had this, you do this. There's nothing missing, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> you know, uh, and that in this space, you are perfect, absolutely perfect to do everything that needs to be done in this class and to take this energy and spread it across the world because your, your passion, your energy is gonna help us continue on. It's gonna inspire someone to do their thing. So let me help you figure out how to do your thing. So cool, if body percussion is not your thing, it will inspire you to go, I really do like music, but I like rapping. Cool, well then how about for the culmination performance, I help you write a 16, I, I help you write a 16 and we put that in for the solo section, you know? So, so yeah. The examples are numerous. I love talking about what I taught in France. I taught in France to a bunch of people, to a bunch of Europeans, which is amazing. Um, and they, this is their first time seeing stepping, their, their second or third time, maybe even seeing a man of color from America. And so I'm explaining to them the history of stepping. But then I stop and go, let's talk about you. Let's talk about your lineage. Because in stepping as a fraternity, we represent the hundred years behind us and the next hundred years in front of us. So I said, think about your family the last 20 years. Think about aunt, uncle, grandma, think about them. That's who you represent to this point. Now think about the children that's gonna be born after the next 20 years, your nieces, your nephews, your great, your great nieces, your, all of that. These are the people that you affect with your actions today. So what are our actions going to do today? What are we gonna to say today? That's what this is about. So that's why we're stepping, everything is strong. That's why everything has intention and purpose. That's why this is an open protest of I will not be broken. That's what this art form is about. So, so, to, to, so I use so yeah, the history of it as the Trojan horse to inspire you to do your own thing in your own life. That's what we're doing. Yeah, so <laughs> when people are like, you teach music? I'm like, yeah, I kind of teach revolution, but this is cool too. Yeah, I teach music, yeah. But um, yeah, that's what Antoine, huh? I'm so sorry to put you on the spot, but speaking of you teaching music, I want to share, and that's why I popped back in, that Antoine came um, to uh, and presented to a group of district leaders, 40 leaders from South San Francisco, principals, superintendent, assistant superintendent, and he led us all through a very, very simple um, and yet complicated and beautiful um, warm up. And I just thought, I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I am will wondering if you were willing to just take us all through what you took those administrators through um, because it's so, I feel like we all got to move too. Like we've been sitting oh. here and we yeah. got to close this out. And I'm asking you on the spot to be our closer today. And will you teach us that, that you shared with the leaders? Oh my goodness, yes, 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 because I haven't talked all day. Okay, everyone, check it out. So it's the chess group. There's four parts. One, two, three, four. For you music people, basically an A, B, C, B. Part two and part four are the same. So you're really only learning three parts. Okay. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter which hand you use, but line number one is going to be hit. You're going to hit your chest. Oh, when you hit your chest, you don't have to hit your chest hard. It's kind of, you can cup your, cup your hand, get that bass in there. So you got hit, snap, and then clap. All right. So line number one is hit, snap, clap. One, two, one more time. Perfection, y'all. Last time, one, two, three, go. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, 
Line number two, you're going to start with a snap. It's going to be snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. Okay? One, two, three, snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. All four parts are going to end with a clap. Okay? Last time, number two. One, two, three, snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. So that's line number one is hit, snap, clap. Line number two is snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. Let's do it together. Line number one and two. One, two, three, go. Hit, snap, clap. Snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. Already, already, people. Greatness is upon us. Line number three, it's seven beats. And it's two snaps, two hits in your chest, two snaps, and a clap. So um, it's, it's not faster. It's just more notes in the same space. So you have... Snap, snap, hit, hit, snap, snap, clap. One more time. One, two, three. Snap, snap, hit, hit, snap, snap, clap. Yeah, y'all. Um, and then the last line is line number two, which was snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. Perfection. Perfection. I love it. All right. So I was just scrolling to see who's Green was under the panelists. All right, you guys are beautiful. All right, so let's do all four lines. One, two, three, and four. <sighs> all right, together. One, two, yeah. Last time, one, two, and three, four. One, two, three, go. Hit, snap, clap. Snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. Snap, snap, hit, hit, snap, snap, clap. Snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. So if you can sing it, you can do it. Um, I apologize for everyone because in a couple of hours, your brain will be like, oh, I got it. And you, you won't let it go. I apologize now. Let's do it one more time. One, two, three, go. Snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. Snap, snap, hit, hit, snap, snap, clap. Snap, hit, snap, hit, clap. I love it because basically this group is, this group is just a twos and fours. It's just twos and fours. Um, and you're really only clapping on twos and fours. <laughs> so that's the beautiful part of it. Um, so yeah, I teach that to, I've taught that to kindergartners and 60 year olds uh, and people in Indonesia. It was pretty dope. Um, so yeah, any more? One more time, feeling it? Let's do it. Um, I wanna just thank you. Yeah, let's do it one more time. I wanna draw people's attention before you leave the room to the chat. There's the end of the day survey. Um, John Aleka from Young Audiences reminded us that all of these artists are connected um, with Young Audiences, so visit their website and check them out. We're thrilled to have them. The county office as a, as a planning partner and Stanford Live as well. Both have worked uh, tirelessly to plan this institute with us. And sure, Antoine, let's close it out one more time. Thank you so much. All right. Boom. One, two, three, go. We got hit, snap, clap, snap, hit. Perfection, y'all. Y'all did great. I love it. Thank you so much, panelists. We are so honored to have you today. It was a rock star panel. My God, I'm just blown away by all of you and your thoughtfulness and your wisdom and your mic drop. I mean, it just was so, so awesome. I'm so deeply, deeply grateful to all of you for being advocates, for standing up, for working with our youth. The chat is flooded with gratitude right now. Um, I, I'm going to cry again like I did this morning. It's just so beautiful to just be in dialogue, be in community. We all have a seat at the table, and um, we can bring change through music and love back into the world. <laughs> Thank you, Till, as well. My pleasure. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, getting some lots and lots and lots of love in the chat coming at all of you right now. Uh, there are two more workshops attendees. There's two more, uh, or there's actually 10 more workshops today, five during each breakout time. Uh, so there's five at 2 p.m. and there's five more at 3 p.m. So uh, feel free to jump into another workshop. Of course, take care of yourself, stretch, 
I just got an Apple Watch for my birthday and it reminded me to stand up because I've been sitting too long. Um, but uh, yeah, drink water, stretch, get out in nature, enjoy the rest of the day. Check out our two, we have two more uh, sessions for the Institute today and we're so grateful for everyone for joining us. Thank you.